Hello everyone and welcome to the Constructed Criticism Network. This network is here to help you improve in Magic the Gathering at every level. From popper leagues to top 1000 mythic, we've got you covered. If you want to hear the entire network, head on over to our sponsor at puremtgo.com where you can hear each and every show, each and every week, and check out their sponsor, MTGO Traders, and tell them that the CCMTG Network sent you. Now sit back, enjoy the show. From YouTube, podcasts, and more, here's this week's episode from ConstructedCriticism.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of Mythicast. I'm your host, Spencer, and I'm joined by a special go- ghost. Ghost? You're a ghost <laughs> now. A special ghost. I mean, you are a ghost from podcast past, you know. Yeah. Uh, we're joined by Matt Klein. What's up, dude? Hey, how's it going? Uh, it's going well. It's going well. Uh, I am finally starting not to be sick for the first time in, like, what feels like months after horrible sinus issues. So that's good. Um, that sounds awesome, really. I mean, yeah, I, I can only imagine how much of a relief that, that it, has to be. It, I was able to, like, lay down last night without he- waking myself up from the sound of my own breath. Sure. So uh, I got over eight hours of sleep last night for the first time in, like, two months. So it was it was nice. It was nice. I got at least eight hours of sleep for the first time in two months. But we're not here to talk about my sleep schedule this week, Matt. We're here to talk about <laughs> historic. Uh Historic has been all the rage the last, it feels like a month. It's, it's honestly getting old. Uh, and, you know, I invited you on because you're playing it way more than I am. Like, just to be honest, I just don't love the format very much. And, uh, you know, you decided that you were a Magic player for some reason again. And <laughs> uh, you've been playing it. So, But before we get too far into that, I do want to mention our sponsor, uh, PRMTJoe.com. Head on over to PRMTJoe. Check out all of the content on the network. Uh, as well as some other awesome, cre- awesome creators. And don't forget to check out their website, their sponsor, sorry, at uh, MTGO Traders, and tell them that the CCMTG Network sent you. Uh, the CCMTG Network is doing well right now. You know, we have a new show on the network from Magic the Gathering Pro Sam Black, where he b- breaks down individual draft archetypes and tells you how to draft them, how they should look, what their strategy is, it is a very in-depth podcast that uh, is going to give you a lot of value to help you learning how to draft specific archetypes. We've got new hosts for our Popper podcast, uh, and Homeward Path is about to hit 100 episodes. So just tons of stuff going on. Tons of stuff, Matt. Yeah, that uh, all sounds pretty good. I mean, the, the, the Sam Black podcast sounds like an insanely valuable resource. Yeah, I, I think so, too. I think that... Uh, you know, what he's doing is really going to help Magic players, so. Uh, this week's Mythic guest is, of course, Matt Kling. Uh, you didn't really qualify the normal way, though, Matt, so. What's the normal way? <laughs> Getting Mythic. I mean, you did, but. I did get Mythic. Yeah, sure, you actually got month. Mythic, like, two days ago, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> 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 you got Mythic and Legend in the same day. What a trooper. <laughs> uh, no, but we are looking for a Mythic guest for next month. Uh, if you want to become one, just let us know that you hit Mythic, whether it's in the uh, He's Game Media Discord, which the link is in the show notes, uh, or over on Twitter at Arena Mythic Cast. But, Matt, the reason you're really here is for a special announcement. Uh, I want to start kicking your butt at Magic again, and mm-hmm. I want to do it on camera. So uh, we're going to bring back Constructed Clash, a weekly video on Arena. And on the on I, I on my Twitter probably not the, the this show's Twitter but well we weekly poll for what format we play between uh, you know standard and historic and then we're also open to suggestions for the for how, kind of how the challenge breaks down man I want your opinion like would you prefer a best a three best of three one best of five like what, what how do you think I should kick your butt I don't think. I don't think I have a strong preference, but I do think three best of threes sounds like a weird format. I'll say that. Yeah, that that one uh, also sounds... Uh, th- that one sounds the easiest for me to edit. Whereas sure. the best of five involves us like conceding to another game right. one. No. Or just playing a game one and then setting it up accordingly. So, you know... Yeah. Uh, you know, we could also just do a best of three, you know, and just really, you know, just really show who's the luckiest in a single weekend in so many sure. cases. The thing <laughs> is, is that when we did do just the one best of three, often 
often it would just be like, no, don't mulligan to four. Like, let's just restart. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, yeah. Are you excited for this? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it should be a good time. I just like playing Magic with you, so I think it'll be a good time. And maybe this will get me to get my button gear and uh, do my weekly money match with you on, <laughs> on Smash. So, uh, yeah, so stay tuned for that on the Constructed Criticism YouTube channel. It should be really fun. Um, but this week's episode is a Power Rankings episode. Through the good grace of Allie Warfield and Mason Clark, this podcast has been blessed with being allowed to do Power Rankings episodes rather than CCMTG doing them. Because they're just one of my favorite episodes to do. I asked permission first. And through their good graces, they've decided that I can have my favorite show on this podcast on the network. <laughs> but... This week, we're just going to use Goldfish Shadow. In the past, we've looked at... And, and Michaela and I talked about this when we talked about these style of episodes. Um, kind of how we didn't know how we wanted to present data. And one of the things that's interesting about Goldfish right now um, it is kind of just how how they pull decks and aggregate them. And Matt, I'm, I'm curious, what, what do you think of MTG Goldfish's data at this point? I mean, prior to this morning, when I looked at it again, I thought it was just unusable. But uh, I actually think that the the SCG satellites have helped immensely because they're not just pulling, you know, a bunch of one three deck lists from FNMs. Yeah, I, I've I found the last couple months that the data has not been what I've been looking for. Um, did you did you look at the screenshot that I posted from last night, or were you looking on the website from this morning? Uh, I looked at both. I, I mean, they're the same. They are the same. Okay, I assumed that there wouldn't there wouldn't be much churn from you know right. twelve a.m. But you know, right. who knows? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think that the future of these episodes will use this information as a data point. Like, if I go to the most popular websites, whether it's MTG Goldfish or MTG Melee, and I'm looking at what the meta game quote unquote looks like. That is a data point other people are going to use to help select their decks, whether it's the first place deck, you know, one of the top three decks, you know. It does influence how the metagame breaks down, so it needs to be a talking point during our power rankings. Uh, but I, I think that it will become just that, just a data point in how we do the power rankings. Maybe we just use SCG satellites and other certain events to, to create the power rankings and then use these percentages to give you a baseline of, of kind of how many decks that breaks down to and stuff like that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, be the change you want to see, right? Exactly. If you, uh, if you want to see what the winning metagame looks like, then just create it. Exactly. Uh, there. So today, instead of just doing five decks, we're going to do six because, uh, well, I, I think that the six Blake deck is interesting and worth talking about because I can't ever beat it. Uh, <laughs> so with that being said, let's jump in at 2.8% which is actually substantially larger than the 7th place deck. I think it was, like, just barely 1% for what it's worth. Um, uh, well, right here, it has, it has the 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 6th and the 7th place deck list at the same percentage. Oh, do they and, now? Yeah, the 8th uh, the place deck list is also only just a little bit behind. Okay, so they did add more decks from last night. Um, yeah, your, your screenshot from last night does not include the decks beyond the top six, that is, so... That is, that is true, but I'm, <laughs> I'm telling you. Right. Uh, with that, with that being said, the, the deck we're gonna give an honorable mention to is, uh, people love calling this Azorius Buggles, and I don't know if, like, that is an accurate description of this deck. No, I mean, to be fair, Boggles isn't an accurate description of Boggles either, because it's Slippery Bogle. <laughs> so it should be Bogles. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Matt, uh, this is a deck that you've actually played some with, and this is a deck that I've lost to a lot, so I'll let you go first as the person probably beating me. Sure. Yeah, yeah. This is the deck that I played uh, most of the way through Diamond, and I think it's quite good. Um, I actually do not think that the blue-white version is as good as the black-white version uh, for a couple of reasons. I mean, your mana is a lot worse, and I think not having Hateful Idol on and like removal spells is actually a big problem as well. Um, although, in my opinion, the black-white lists have actually gone off the deep end and started playing, like, four Kaya's ghost forms in the main and stuff like that, but... Uh, anyway, so when basically... You the, when you say the mana of worse, are you talking about Concealed Courtyard? Yes. Yeah, Concealed Courtyard is a lot better. And also, you get the, uh, the pathway. Oh, sure, you actually have two... Yeah. 
that that makes a lot. Yeah, you're playing like 13 basics in the in the blue white version, and I think you're only playing like you know four basics or whatever. Yeah, Six the list that I pulled like... was uh, uh, I'm gonna say Michael's name wrong. I think it's Michael Bonday, um, uh-huh. Pro Tour Top Eight competitor, and he's he's playing 10 basics with two irrigated farmland, which I'm sure that you're not a fan of either. Yeah, I mean tap lands aren't great. I mean it's probably better than just playing infinite basics because the basic islands are so bad so often, but. Um, uh, yeah, he he is also the person that I pulled uh, my blue white list from. I I'm not sure that we pulled it from the same place though, because I know he played it in the satellites this weekend as well. But I pulled it from the. Uh, he was one of the two thousand dollar winners from the arena open. Yeah. Yep. I I think that the, this is just an updated list from that list. Right. So, this deck uh, beats me a lot, Matt, and I think that. Uh, the reason for that is not what I expect. Like, I would expect to just, like, not be able to beat, like, a Curious Obsession. Mm -hmm. But far more often than that for me, it's actually Arcane Flight that, like, they just put an Arcane Flight on something and just, like, almost one-shot me pretty often. Right. Like, there's not really a lot you can do to play around one mana kill you. Right. Yeah, I mean, it really depends on what deck you're playing, right? Like, uh, I mean, the Alisade does a pretty good impression of Arcane Flight as well, even in the black-white version, unless... The, the only exception is Nissa. Nissa is actually really hard to beat if you don't have arcane flights. Right. Um, just because she makes colorless blockers. Right. I, I to be fair, you know, I, I've mostly been playing uh, Sultai, and you know, uh, I have beaten Hateful Eidolon a few times, and I don't know that I've ever beaten a resolved arcane flight. That's very interesting because I I actually find that the Sultai matchup is the main reason why I like the black white list over this one. Talk to me even, about that. So even though Nissa is really a problem for the black white list, you just really need the churn. Like it's 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 pretty easy to have a game play out where your opponent just has like three removal spells and a wrath, and you just can never beat that with the blue white version. And with the black white version, it's actually not hard to beat at all. So well, the problem is I shouldn't say it's playing, not hard to beat at all, but not playing it's that many wraths. Easier. Uh, it depends on what list you're playing. I mean, a lot of the lists right now, I mean, I don't know if you've looked at the newest lists, but they're all playing, like, uh, Cry of the Carnarium in the main. I ha- I saw I saw one list with Cry in the main recently, yes. Right. I, I have not been doing that, though, for what it's worth. Sure. So that that's, like, the the new pro technology list. They're playing uh, Tail's End in the main as well. It's, I, uh, I've been doing that, yes. I know uh, Yuki Ichikiro was playing it and some other pro in, in a satellite. Yeah. Uh, uh, the list I'm playing is pretty close. Or Ichikawa, rather. Right Sorry. <laughs> really, really close to LSV's last list. Sure. That had the. Uh, I'm not playing quite as many tails as end as him, but it's pretty close to that. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I, I just wanted to mention these decks because I think that I mean just all that glitters specifically is a important part of the meta game and something you have to be aware of. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I you would think that the deck would be a lot more about. About uh, all the writers and it's well, not. You would you would think it would be a lot more about riding one one uh, creature to victory, and it is sometimes. But honestly, I think that it's it's more about the fact that everything is, everything can trips, right? Like it's fine if your SRAM with three auras on it dies because it just drew, it already drew three cards, you know? Like yeah, it's true. I mean, the churn that you talked about is is really helpful. Uh, let's let's go into the top five. Um, the the fifth place deck. Uh, I is there a name for this deck, Matt? Uh, Azorius control. Uh, the fifth place deck is. Uh, t- oh, you're talking about the. Oh, I see. They, yeah, they have that updated since yesterday. Um, so okay. It's, so it's it's just simic simic mid range or simic combo, whatever you want to call it. I mean, okay. simic combo seems bet like a more apt description, but. Yeah. So is this deck in the top five this morning? Uh, it's yeah, it's in fourth right now. Okay, so they just switched, uh, those. Yeah, so let, let's talk about the Simic slash Teamer deck. Um, we're really only playing red for Escape the Wilds. Yeah, I mean, th- there are a few different versions. You can either play it just straight Simic, you can play it with the red splash for Escape the Wilds, or you can play Sultai with a splash for a few removal spells and possibly, like, Thought Seizes out of the board or whatever. Sure. But but the, the base here, um, you know, is a deck with four Emery, four Analana Worlds, and... Uh, I'm always going to get this. The the is it a Bonder Prodigy? Uh yes. So so how does how does how does this Karn deck win, dude? 
Uh, well, most of the time you're actually going to win with the combo, which is the combo is Paradox Engine and Emery and then any card in your deck. Um, yeah, you, you can go infinite mana, infinite draw with uh, with Chromatic Sphere and Kinnon or uh, or just like Mind Stone and Chromatic Sphere or, you know, at Mox Amber, Chromatic Sphere. Uh, you can also just make infinite mana with just two Mox Ambers um, and you get infinite uh, cast triggers as well. And then eventually you're going to find a Karn and win the game by casting Aether Flux Reservoir out of the sideboard. What uh, what is stopping a deck like for this from just you know taking over a meta game that is n- not full of a ton of insanely powerful combos? I think that this deck is super new and also super hard to play, and I think it's the best deck right now. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that people will adapt the sideboard to be a lot better than what it is right now because a lot of your wish targets suck, and that's just always kind of true with Karn. But, um, yeah, I think that the the combination of just being able to play a fair game and Kinnon actually being kind of broken and Emery being definitely broken uh, really puts the stack over the top. I also think the Escape the Wilds are the best way to play it. Yeah, the list the list that I'm looking at uh, is from Sandy Dog, and uh, the I've played against this deck a few times, um, and... You know, luckily I've drawn a, a fair number of, of Thought Seasons and Removal Spells and Nissa to mm-hmm. win the game quickly. But it felt like I was on a clock that I, like, was precariously close to losing to. Yeah. Uh, well, the other thing is you can just kill people out of nowhere. Like, um, it looks like Sandy Dog's list is actually not playing this card in the sideboard. But uh, Mason's Cl- Mason Clark's list had a... Uh, Strider harness in the sideboard, and that card was insane. It was like Is that the, the one best wish haste? target in the deck. Yeah. What are you giving haste to? Just Emery. Oh. There were there were a bunch of times where you'd just be like, okay, you know, because uh, you just have like a ton of mana a lot of times, so you would just like have a paradox engine in play, and you're like, okay, activate Kinnon, get you know, hit Emery off of that, put the Emery in play, play a Karn, get the Strider harness, play the Strider harness on the Emery. And like the whole time you're make, you're like actually making mana when you're doing this because if you have a bunch of mana rocks and a paradox engine and play like it just it's just making mana especially with the Kinnon, right like so then you're casting the Strider harness and then you just start going off with Emery with you know chromatic spear or whatever. Yeah, one thing that I will say is that this deck uh, is one of those way harder to play online than in paper type of decks, and yeah. I it, I think that that contributes to its amount of play that it has seen in the SCG satellites this weekend. Yeah, it's it's true. It's definitely hard, especially on Arena, to like win the game with the with just Chromatic Sphere and Emery and Paradox Engine, like because you have to draw through like a, a good portion of your deck. Right. Um, I had a game recently where you know I only had one Karn left in the deck or whatever, and uh, ended up getting timed out because I just had to I had to cycle through like thirty cards or whatever in a turn trying to find a uh, the last Karn, but. Do you think that, you know, as as next sometime next year when, you know, we start going to GPs and 1Ks and SEGs and, you know, 5Ks, like, do you think this deck will pick up in popularity if Historic becomes a format that people play in paper? I am unsure if there's incentive for Historic in paper, but hypothetically, assuming that there was, yeah, I think that this deck could be more popular in paper. Uh, not not a ton though. Like it's got a it's got a very KCI feel. Like it doesn't have a bunch of the weird rules shenanigans the KCI had. But sure, uh, I do think that will give people you know a similar a similar taste in their mouth at least. So they I I don't know. I doubt that it'll be insanely popular, but I do think that it will be the best deck to play. Yeah, it, it's funny that uh, as we move on to what was the fourth place deck last night, which you're saying is the fifth place deck now. When you said you agreed with the. Uh... The top four decks. I was like, I don't think that the fourth place deck is even close to. Oh sure, yeah. I, I don't. I don't think blue white control is a real deck really in historic. So I'm yeah. surprised that it even is in the top five right now, let alone the top four. Yeah. So let, let's talk about this deck. Uh, obviously, uh, won the Zendikar Rising Championship, and you know, I, I don't know, man. Like this is my type of deck, right? And I. Just don't think, I, I don't know, like, it's hard to convince me that, like, playing cast out is where I want to be in this format. Right. I, I, and I don't know that it breaks down to much more than that. 
Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it really just depends on how how good you think sensor is, I guess. <laughs> sure, but like, I'm still playing four absorbs. I'm still like, there's just a lot of this sure. is really where I want to be in a world where so much of what's going on is inherent value and inherent card advantage from just creatures that people are already playing or just spells that people are already playing. It's just hard for me to believe that I'm going to get there by just like casting an absorb or casting a cast out. Yeah, I think that the the biggest boon for this deck is actually that you get to main deck main deck Grafter's Cage. That's true. That card is basically unbeatable for half the meta game in game one. That's true, but but that that's not just true of this deck, right? Like mono red also gets to do that. Uh, it's a lot worse to main deck something like that in mono red, though. That's true. You're you're out of card in a lot of ways. Yeah. Where where do you think this deck does land? Like you said, you don't even think it's a real deck, but th I mean. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's it's probably something that could theoretically take a tournament just by, you know, people not being prepared for it. But it would definitely not be the kind of thing I'd be looking to play. Yeah. They did add uh, a new deck from last night uh, from the SCG Satellite. Mm -hmm. um, so it looks like some SCG Satellites were added. It actually took me a while to find a winning, like, a deck, I didn't even, like, the one that I put in our show notes is literally just the one from the Mythic Championship, because it was actually just so hard to find a winning version of this deck list from the SCGs from basically any event recently. Sure. And, you yeah, know... I mean, even, even even recently, you can't find a list from the SCGs that went better than 4-2, and two, so... Right, which, you know, I think, I think says a lot about the decline of this deck in the Mendigame, game, even from just a few weeks ago. Right. Uh, the next the next deck coming in at third are sack decks combined. Um, do you like combining decks like this on like a power ranking style, you know, conversation? Not really. Um, I I do think that the Rakdo sacrifice deck and the the collected company sacrifice deck and the trail sacrifice decks are all pretty different functionally. Um, yeah, I agree. That was that was one of my first thoughts. Is like, well. It was just how different collected company and trail decks are, and then you're in you're adding another even another layer to that when you when you add the Rakdos decks. Right. Yeah. I would say that even like I would say that the company and the trail versions are closer than the than the Rakdos version is to either. So, uh, which which of these three decks do you think is the best sacrifice deck? I like the Rakdos one right now. Okay. Um. I think that Chandra is actually insane. Uh, it actually helps a lot of what, like, I already liked the Rakdos deck one the most before. And, uh, I mean, like, the biggest problem was that you could just never beat uh, Yusharn. But now with main deck Chandra Torch of Defiance, you actually can. Um, it looks like, you know, only about 50% of the lists are main decking Torch of Defiance. But I, I have personally found that to be very good. Yeah, I, I think that... Also, it it adds a lot of the things that you like about, or I don't know that you like, but that I liked about the green versions of the decks. That inherent card advantage that kind of push you over in some cases, uh, you know. Yeah, it's it's a good way to beat Grafter's Cage too, right? Like sometimes you just don't have to care about it. Right. Exactly. Um, I posted a list in our show notes, Matt, and I I I am not always the best at understanding like what something is for and i need to understand <laughs> what this necro uh necromentia is for in this 5-1 list do you know uh i take it you're looking at a different list than the one that i'm finding from the show notes the you're I'm looking at you're not looking jund, at the, the jund list. yeah okay um I have literally no idea what that card's for that card looks terrible to me but i i'm told that that's the best version of that card why I have no idea. All right. I, I I think that, I mean, if you're playing a straight combo deck, I can appreciate that that's better than letting them draw cards, right? Um, okay. But I don't know. I, I mean, obviously these aren't these aren't straight combo decks. That that's guess, my the, the thought is the thought is that you can deal with the two twos pretty easily, but I I don't know. It just doesn't seem right to me, and I also don't know that there's. I mean, it, it's closer now that there's actually a combo deck, right? Like if you name Emery or whatever in the. Sure. Out of the uh, Paradox Engine deck, it's it's going to be at least decent. I am not unknown for disliking Memoricide type effects, uh, but this one in this deck specifically 
doesn't make a ton of sense to me. Um, but also, I have been playing less Magic over the last, you know, year than most people. And so, you know, there could be some, some metagame changes that I need to catch up to. That right. I don't, that I don't quite understand. Oh, wow, they're main decking Necromancia in this one. <laughs> That's what I'm saying! <laughs> okay, yeah, that, that seems just wrong. Unless there's some... There's no reason. I guess if you really need your opponent to have creatures, maybe... Why do you need that though? Oh, just for the for like claim the firstborn interactions. Claim the firstborn. That seems sketch. It seems it seems not right to me, but yeah, okay. I don't know. Yeah, for me, uh, I would play uh, probably Rakdos first, Trail second, uh, uh, Company third. Sure. Yeah, I, I would probably play Rakdos then Company then Trail at the moment. Okay. Uh, in second place, we have the Gabos. And Matt, I need to know, how good do you think this deck is? I think it's quite good. It's a, uh, especially a lot of the people have started main decking the Herald's Horns now, and that card I think is is really good and shores up a lot of the problems that you were normally having with the deck, just like running out of gas, you know. Yeah. I, so for me, I, I I think this deck is quite strong. I think it it is it is definitely right there at the second the second best deck in the format, and. You know, I, I've I've listened to a lot of people say that they just don't think this deck is good, and that it will just fall out of the metagame again. And I just don't agree. I think that uh, there's a lot of value in having both a card that will just win you the game on the spot from any position in the game if you can resolve it, and like you know, I, I think that Mindstone is like a huge get for this deck. I think that uh, you know Harold's Horn, like you said, fixes up a lot of problems for this deck, and just you know, continuing to innovate on what was already one of the the better decks in the format, I, I think has pretty big benefits for goblins, and and I honestly hope to see uh, Muxus banned. So yeah, I I don't know. It doesn't feel like it's problematically good to me. Um, like it might feel unfun to lose to a Muxus just because you're so far ahead and then you just lost. But yeah, uh, I mean, that is I, that is the reason. I, I think want to that ban. that's I think that that's just a. A perspective thing though like you when you're looking at a game that way it's 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 not really seeing the game the way that it's actually being played right because the this deck is actually just resolve muxus and win it's just a combo deck right like it's just yeah. make it's mana and muxus and like i don't know i i don't think that it's i i don't think that i'm that upset when i lose to a combo so yeah i i think that it is uh i don't know it it goes contrary to the way that i play magic when the, like you know, I play Magic as a resource battle most of the time, mm -hmm. and you can't play against Goblins as a resource battle. Yeah, it's just it's just not that kind of matchup, right? Like you're yeah. just you're just supposed to kill the mana, and the you know the Snoop obviously because it just generates infinite cards, and then you know try not to let them resolve a Muxus. That's that's certainly been my game plan. Um, and occasionally you can beat a Muxus when it resolves, but yeah, I mean you you certainly can. Um, but yeah, I I agree with you. I think this deck is quite good easily second best deck in the format and definitely something that kind of like you like we've been saying like understanding how to play against this deck will dramatically increase your win percentage against it i think right uh number one we have the uro mid-range decks these are combined i actually am okay with these ones being combined for what yeah, it's worth I, I i agree these ones have the you know very similar game plan so uh and a special shout out to friend of the show gavin uh, whose list is the one that I'm pulling up. But, yeah, I I, I think that this deck uh, specifically has, you know, a lot of the things needed. It actually does look like, the, by the way, the list in the show notes does have the Cry Main, which is why I said I had seen one with that. Yeah, um, he's playing He's playing just the same list as, uh, as uh, e e like, Cease, okay. except it looks like maybe he cut one Cry for the second event. Nice. But yeah, I, I think that this this is the deck that I've been playing. Um, like, if I were to play a list, I would probably just pull Gavin's list and and try it out. Uh, just because there are some, some cards specifically that I want to try out. But there, this this list has gone through a lot of innovation in the last couple weeks, Matt. Um, which kind of surprises me that a deck that... I don't know, because so much of it is not for the mirror. So maybe it was forced to adapt this way. But I, I'm really impressed with where this deck has ended up as far as, like, a classic ramp control deck. 
Yeah, I mean, I think the tails ends were the biggest innovation. Um, I'm not really sure how it was figured out, but it turns out every single card that matters at all in this format is legendary. So, <laughs> yeah, t tails end has been quite good. I, I have been playing two in my list, and I, I think that I've been wrong for for only playing the two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that card has been spectacular. Have um, you have you gotten the chance to play with and against the Ashiok that uh, th that innovation? Yeah, I've played with it and a little bit against it. Uh, yeah, I've been quite. Been okay. I, I've yeah. been quite impressed with that innovation, along with the. Um, I really, really liked the Elder Gargoroths in the sideboard over the last couple days. Um, okay. So, so, so talk to me about that. What matchups are you siding in? Because I like it against Sack and like Gruel. Um, th those are the those. So specifically on on ladder uh, and you know on arena, I find that I'm playing against Gruel a higher percentage of the time than is probably appropriate in the metagame. And right. then against against the the sacrifice decks, it it can't be claimed, right. um, which I really like because it lets you stabilize your board without getting claimed. Yeah, definitely. I mean, th those are definitely the matchups where I like it, but it's hard for me to feel like having two Elder Gargoroths in the sideboard is is uh, worthy also, of either I like of those. It, I like, like it fine in the mirror too, for what it's worth. Interesting. Like, so it, it certainly it certainly is susceptible to Maelstrom Pulse, but like if they're pulsing this, I think you're pretty happy comparatively. I think the bigger problem with it is like you're playing a five mana spell that's just going to be worse than whatever their five mana spell is. <laughs> like if you if you're not playing it on turn five, I don't think it's very good. Like if you're going to wait until turn, you know, seven at best, uh, to cast it, I don't think that's very good. And if you're playing it on turn five and then they just play, you know, an sure, Ashiok or a Nissa, you're pretty that's, far behind there. That's that that's a good point. Um, that that's fair. Uh, where do you think? Where do you like Shark Typhoon? If I can ask that. Uh, I boarded it in the mirror. Uh, no, I guess I didn't last time I played the mirror. I don't know. I'm very unclear on that card. Like, obviously, I like it against hard control decks, but yeah, that's uh, that's the only place I've started boarding it in. Yeah, I I didn't board it in the last time I played the mirror, but I, I could see an argument for it. The thought distortion, I kind of felt the same about too. <laughs> I thought distortion, I boarded in the mirror and and against control. So sure, yeah, it just really depends on. Yeah, it's probably it's probably worth it in the mirror. I did I did end up boarding it in later, but I don't know. It's it's pretty unclear on me uh, to me what the sideboard slots are for, uh, especially with all the the recent changes to the sideboard that yeah. there have been. Do you do you prefer the Sultai version or the is it Yasharin? Yeah, uh, I I definitely think Sultai is better. I I don't think that you really need the Yasharin for the sack matchup. Like it takes it from a pretty close matchup to like a slam dunk, but I think that. You can you can definitely beat any of the stack decks with Sultai without it, and uh, I think that it makes your mana quite a lot worse. Okay, cool. Yeah, I have. I'm just gonna continue playing Uro until it's banned. So, sure. I think that's where I'm at in the format. Uh, that is gonna do it for the Power Rings. Those are the uh, top six decks. I mean, really more than that. Can, can I talk, can I talk to you about that though for a second? Do you yeah. think that this is an Uro deck? <laughs> I feel like everybody feels like this is an Uro deck. I feel like I mean, it's called Nissa mid range. Yeah, it's de it's definitely Nissa who shakes the world. That card is broken. I, yeah, it's, I this is literally Nissa who shakes the world and then a supporting cast. And I've seen people try to play this deck with three Nissas, including uh, Yugi Ichikawa, and it seems crazy to me. Including Spencer Howland. Yeah, I, that's just that's I played just I played nonsense. one event with with three Nissa <laughs> and was like, well, this was wrong. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. I, I think that this very much is a Nissa deck, but I do think Uro will be the one that gets the the ban hammer or something that's banned in this. Sure. I mean, that might be fair. I mean, but, Nissa gets a lot worse without Uro, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, she does get worse. I I mean, it's it's probable that without Uro, this deck just has like a fatal hole in it that it can't fill. But I, I do think that Nissa is the most powerful card in this deck. Like if I if I ever have one in play, if I ever if I could choose to have one in play, it would be Nissa. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I had... feel I feel very favored in the mirror when my opponent has an Uro in play. And I have a Nissa. I think Nissa takes over games really well in this deck. You know, just the mana advantage itself that Nissa gives you is often insurmountable. Like, it doesn't really matter what you're doing with your mana at that mm. point. You just have so much of it. Yeah, and just being able to double spell, right? Like, the amount yeah. of times that you can Triple play, spell. play I mean, Nissa. I... Well, I mean, even on the turn on turn five when you play her, right? Like, oh, you can yes, play Nissa yeah. and then hold up Eliminate or Aether Gust or Tails End oh, or man. Growth you, Viral. You do, or... you do all the time. Like, it's so yeah. often make a 3-3, three, three, 
protect everything. Like you just don't. Yeah, you, even... yeah, you get to attack and block with the three three. And yeah. Like, yeah, it's it's so much, and like the aggro decks can almost never beat it, right? Like they have like one turn to kill you after you play an Issa, and then if they don't, it's just the end of the game. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And thank you for bringing up that point, Matt. Uh, that, that will do it for this week. It's a little bit shorter episode, uh, you know, but I, I, I think that maybe I'll jump back into historic. I have been enjoying my time with Sultai, but I, I get frustrated pretty easily in magic these days and historic kind of compounds the things that I get frustrated with. So, sure. uh, Maybe I'll maybe I'll give it another spin. That's all I played this week, though. So I guess I shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't play much Magic, but all I've been playing is Historic. Uh, Matt, if people want to find you uh, losing to me uh, at Magic the Gathering, they can do that on the YouTube channel as soon as we get our schedule set up for Constructor Clash. Uh, how how bad do you think you're gonna lose? Hmm. I'm not really sure how to answer this. This is like one of those trick questions. Well, the thing is, I, the thing I, is, I don't is, think that I'm going to lose. What? I do not think that I'm going to lose. The thing is, is that I know you try harder when I talk smack. <laughs> and so my goal in this podcast was to make sure to really. I feel like I've, I've never, I've never not tried as hard as I could when there's something on the line, like, you know, pride for a video. <laughs> It's just well, like at like GPs or whatever, where there's basically nothing on the line that sometimes I don't try. Yeah, it's like, it's like only in the top end of a GP do you give up trying. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can find Matt at the Witch Fling. You can find me at Spencer Thirteen H. You can find Michaela at Mythic Michaela. Michaela should be back next week. Uh, wishing her the best. And uh, you can find the show at Arena Mythicast if you tweet at the show or post your Mythic list inside the He's a Game Media discord uh we'll try and get you on the show and you know we we try and do one a month but you know i try and get people lined up that you know are, are recurring guests and things like that so you can don't forget to give us a like as a sub on youtube uh, if you get a chance to write us a review if you're listening to the podcast it is super helpful thank you everybody so much for listening and we'll see you guys all next week with another episode of mythicast